Good evening. Hello. Wow, it, it's great to see so many people here. We were afraid everybody was going to stay home and watch on uh, our, our uh, Facebook feed. So um, welcome, everyone. My name is Kim O'Reilly, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the League of Women Voters here in Reading. And I am so happy to see everyone, and I want to thank our candidates for coming out tonight and spending some time with us. For those of you who are not familiar with the Reading League of Women Voters, we are a nonpartisan organization that works to educate voters and encourage active participation in the political process. Since our founding in Reading in 1959, we have sponsored a variety of events and forums to share information about major public policy issues, and we have been known to have championed many causes within Reading that have had a lasting impact on our community. I invite everyone here to get involved with the League, both men and women. Yes, although we're the League of Women Voters, we are um, nonpartisan and uh, equal opportunity organization. We actually have three men on our board of directors. The League provides a really unique opportunity to work with your friends and neighbors in town across party lines toward a common purpose, which is ensuring that we have a vibrant and healthy community. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from our neighbors and friends who are running for municipal office. They are all volunteers, and we are lucky in Reading to have so many qualified people who are willing to give of their time and themselves to help our town and schools manage and even excel within the challenging fiscal and social climate that we find ourselves in. With so much in flux nationwide, it is important to become advocates for our own local town and, our, and its institutions. Please join me in welcoming our candidates who are debating this evening, and I'm going to announce them in the order in which they will be debating. Um, our candidates running for first selectman are Julia Pemberton and John Shaven, who are up here uh, ready to go. Uh, candidates running for the board of the selectmen, Peg O'Donnell and Michael Thompson. Candidates running for the Board of Finance, Ward Mazuko, Karen Gifford, and Chris Parkin. And candidates running for the Region Eastern Reading Region 9 Board of Education, Cheryl Graziano, Gwen Denny, and Sean Alexander. So we have a really full agenda tonight with four debates and ten candidates, and we will do our best to accommodate as many of your question as time allows. So please understand we do have a, t a tight agenda. There are just some uh, unique election rules that play a role in the races we are featuring tonight. And we have a great handout out at the back of the room um, that explains these rules. And I, I really encourage everybody to take one. We will also be making this handout available online. But just to um, make you aware of one such rule, um, some of you may wonder why we are holding a de debate for the Board of Selectmen this evening as it appears to be an unopposed race with two candidates running for two open seats. But according to the election rules, if the candidate who loses the race for first Selectmen receives more votes than one of the two candidates running for the Board of Selectmen, the losing first Selectmen candidate would win a seat on the Board of Selection. So in essence, it's a three-way race for two seats. So please, when you vote in November, please be sure to vote for every race on the ballot. Following tonight's debate, we will be sharing a link to the recorded debate as well as individual statements from each candidate running for office. I ask everyone to do three things after this evening's debate. Share the recording of the debate with your friends and family who could not attend. Read the candidate's statements and learn more about the candidates, their views on the critical issues facing our community. And finally, consider joining the League. I think you would really enjoy being part of our organization. Finally, I just want to mention and extend thanks to uh, all who have worked to bring you this debate tonight. Uh, Cole Tucker Walton in the back here is our Voter Services Chair. <laughs> Colleen Joyce is our moderator. Um, our, our many league volunteers, our question screeners in the back, and Bob and Chris for filming tonight and broadcasting the debate. Uh, 
We also want to uh, thank Rob Blick and the town of Reading for making this uh, venue available to the league. It's now my pleasure to introduce Colleen Joyce, who as an elected director of the Reading League of Women Voters is serving in the role of moderator this evening. Colleen is an attorney presently serving on the Secretary of the State's Legal Assistance Project, which monitors the election process and responds to problems at the polling places on election day. Here you go, Colleen. Thank you for coming and thank you for listening. This evening, we are going to abide by the classic debate time format. This enables the candidates to have an equal amount of time to answer questions. And they also have a minute to do a closing statement. The two-person debates will be about 20 minutes and the three-person debates about 30 minutes. Each candidate has a minute and a half to answer each question without interruption. The timekeepers will indicate when there are 30 seconds left and then when the time is up. We ask each candidate to please answer in the allotted time. I'm confident you will all respect the process. The viewers, all and you present, have been at, invited to submit written questions for our candidates. We will do our best, but it's likely that we will not get to all of them. Each round of discussion will be initiated by me posing a question to the candidate, and they'll take turns being first to respond to the question. And after the round of questions, at the end, they'll have time for a closing statement. Those present, please mute your cell phones. And we look forward to an informative and respectful debate, which will pro provide an opportunity for all of us to hear the candidates' views. Our first question. Our town is going through a divisive time. Do you think that united, uniting Reading is the responsibility of the first selectman, and if so, what would you do to unite the town? And it'll be Julia Pemberton first and John Chabin next. Oh, well, let me just announce, sorry, Julia is running on the Democratic, as a Democratic candidate and John Chabin as a Republican. I do think that the first selectman has a responsibility to work to unify a town that has become divided over a number of issues. But in conjunction with community organizations such as the League of Women Voters, also Youth Athletic League, to simply across the community, really pulling different groups together with different points of view to facilitate community-wide conversations. And I think rather than starting with some of the most controversial subjects, as I think I said in one of my um, responses to another question, to start with a discussion about inclusion. What does it mean to each individual to feel welcome in the community? I think if we start there, we can all agree we want our children to feel safe, welcome in school. We want our residents to feel welcomed and heard and included in what happens in town. That's fairly non-controversial. I actually reached out to a community foundation that is doing this kind of work, uh, the Fairfield County Community Foundation. There was a lot of experience in this. Um, so starting with that discussion about inclusivity um, and then perhaps diving into some of the more difficult conversations about equity and then diversity, which I think will ultimately tie into what happens in Georgetown. Those are our opportunities to really expand um, discussions and essentially what does the town of Reading look like as we continue to develop further into Georgetown. But we do absolutely have a role, and I look forward to taking that on. Thank you. John? Well, first, thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you for having me. Is this working? Do you, do you guys hear me fine? Good. Um, I'm John Chabin, obviously. I do believe the first selectman should play a role in, in setting the tone and, and setting an example, and especially some of the more divisive issues that we've seen <clears throat> years past and, and maybe over the last year or so. Um, we can and should promote positive discussions. We, shan't, we, we can and should promote community forums such as this or, or other places. Uh, we can and should recognize that, that some of these issues are best first brought up at home, but that being, that being said, that's not the only place they're brought up. So I think if we recognize our role as elected officials and our role in, in, the, in the titles we have, um, and then juxtapose those or, or leverage off the, our roles as parents and community members, uh, I think we can set a better example. Because over the last year or two, 
it, we, it's become a little cranky. I mean, you know, let's be, let's be serious. I mean, people are putting up signs and calling names and pointing fingers, and that's not the Reading I moved to 20 years ago. That's not it. We've had divisive issues here before. When I was in the state legislature, we had, we, we had uh, votes on the death penalty. We had votes on transgender bills. We had votes on gun bills. We had all kinds of votes, and we convened forums in this room to hear what people had to say about those issues, and we left here as a better educated population, and we left here feeling a little more community oriented. Um, I, as first selectman, I'll promote that again, and I look forward to having all those discussions. Thank you. The next question will go first to you, John, mm -hmm. and it deals with Georgetown and Gilbert and Bennett. What are the most important steps to take now in getting the Gilbert and Bennett project restarted and what will be your focus? Well, the most important step to take now is to start taking steps. I mean, it, I, when, I, when I, I was on the zoning board when we put this, when the zoning, uh, the master plan in, I was the chairman of the sewer commission when we built the plant and, and brought it back. And when I went to Hartford in 2011 as your state rep, uh, you know, we were in a position to do a lot of things that frankly haven't been done. It's been 10 years and not a single brick has been laid in Georgetown in 10 years, not a brick. Not one. What we have to do is re-engage developers who have remained interested in the last 10 years, but heretofore haven't gotten returned phone calls or any expressed interest from our town. We have to re-engage them, and we have, to, we have to use the tools that have been set up, some out of Hartford and some out of uh, public financing, to get the project back, back in order. I mean, I'm all about building teams about learning what we can and should do and moving forward. We can, we can talk about coalitions and committees and all this other stuff. Nothing's been done in 10 years. Things could have been done in eight years ago, six years ago, four years ago, and I'm here to do them now. The first thing we're gonna do is get developers back in the game. The second thing we're gonna do is try and work with some of this bond debt that's, that's, that's hanging around. We gotta figure out how it has to either get restructured, bought out, or extinguished through a bunch of means so we can get more detail in. And the third thing we gotta do is get the town back on board. We have no one in charge down there. There's no, there's no longer anyone running the property. We have to get the town back on board about what can be done. The old charrette from 10, 12 years ago, probably doesn't apply anymore, but we can build a mixed use, vital, quaint community center down there. The thing we gotta do is do it and not talk about it. Thank you. Julia, same question. There's almost nothing factual in that statement. Let me start off by saying that. I came into this role eight years ago and I promised to focus like a laser beam on the problem of Gilbert and Bennett. It was essentially a dead ball. My opponent was part of the team that left that ball on the field and should have known and should have asked the questions to move that project forward. And instead they left it hanging in the wind. So I picked it up, did my homework, uncovered a mountain of debt, insider deals, and just basically shady behavior, took it to court, and the town came out on top. And now we are in the driver's seat. Things are moving forward. I meet with developers all the time. My phone rings off the hook. And in fact, John, you brought me a developer about eight years ago. And you never called him back. Uh, we had meetings. You and you No, John. Oh you know something? What I tell them is that there's not an opportunity for you here now. A lot of these developers want to throw hundreds of departments up, hundreds of apartments. So let me say this. I am focused like a laser beam on this project. I have gone to Hartford. I have spoken with developers. I know what the market is. I know what the opportunities are. And I know how to get the money to move this forward. So let's be honest. We are cleaning this up, and we are cleaning up the mess that was left us eight years ago. We are in charge of that property. We have a quarter million dollars in revenue now that the old developer was collecting that we could have had all along. So this project is moving forward. And we're going to get it done, and done right. Thank you. The next question has to do with our public health and COVID. This will start with Julia. Reading has some of the lowest vaccination rates in the region. What will you do to get Reading residents vaccinated and back to normal? Right. OK, that's a really good question. And I think what we have in Reading is on, on both sides of the equation, we have a population that is very resident to get reticent to become vaccinated. On the conservative side and on the very progressive side, there is a mistrust of big pharma. I hear that. Um, on one side, it's about personal freedom, and the other side, again, about suspicion over pharmaceutical industry. So what have I been doing? I have been going online. I have been doing weekly and almost daily updates about our COVID numbers on Facebook, 
doing promoted posts. I take CDC videos about the safety of our vaccinations and promote them, and I actually can see the analytics. Who's watching them? And based on that data, how many new people are coming into our COVID vaccination clinics to be vaccinated? And I see those numbers slowly ticking up. So our message and my message ongoing is that vaccinations are safe, get vaccinated, it will help keep our community safe. Um, we have regular vaccination clinics here in Reading. We're now running booster clinics here in Reading. So my message is constant, daily, weekly. Please get vaccinated, keep our children safe. We have a thousand children in Reading who cannot be vaccinated. Interestingly, it's the 44 to 64 age group that has the lowest vaccination rate at 63%. It's the seniors and the 22 year old, 22 to um, 43 year olds who have the highest vaccination rates, followed by the, um, the high schoolers. So uh, the message is constant, and I'll continue that effort. Thank you, John. Thank you. In large part, I agree with what Julia just said. I think it is, I think it is incumbent upon first selectmen and the selectmen to, to promote uh, vaccinations. I, I, I've been vaccinated. I believe they work. I understand some people don't. So people, you know, we have to kind of weigh the balance of how people feel personally and how people feel what's right for their kids and, and their own person. Uh, we, can't, we can't bully people over the top of their personal beliefs, but at the same time, we can promote what we think to be, you know, our common goal is, and that's and that's to try and create herd immunity. I think we're almost there. I think we probably are there, um, but, but uh, yeah, I think the message has to be positive. With the remaining time, we need to go back to the Georgetown stuff because there was almost nothing factual in what Julia said. When she took over eight years ago, there were tools and funding sources and developers chomping at the bit. I was call, I, I, we went to lunch with one of them. I, I introduced another developer. These developers all call me back and say, listen, we're willing to work with, with you know, town leaders you know, to get them across the finish line, but we're not going to drag them to the start line. And that's what's been going on for eight years. No phone calls, no return calls. And then this lawsuit, the lawsuit was about, was about a bond priority. It has nothing to do with about what you can build down there and what you should build down there had nothing to do with being able to use the tools that I helped put in place and and told the town you could separate that project at 60 acres you could do it in five acre increments you could sell them off in five acre increments clean them up most of the cleanup has been done there's still some stuff left to do I'm an environmental lawyer I served on the environment committee I'm a construction lawyer I know what can be done what should be done and what hasn't been done and what hasn't been done in eight years thank you is that one single brick and has you been laid. thank you it, John when you have the opportunity not true at that, that all. Is, it's not true. Thank no. you both. We'll address it. Given, given this communication, I think this is an appropriate next question. John, this starts with you, and it has to do with sh public communication. Mm -hmm. Given there's no daily or weekly newspaper, how would you improve reliable communication in our town to keep the citizens informed on important issues just like Gilbert and Bennett? Right, right. That's a good question, and, and you know, here's where I give Julie some credit. I know when, when she's tried, she's actually tried to spread the word on some of this stuff as of late. Um, you know, in, in the past, it's been, we've been kind of in a vacuum, because you're right, the, the newspapers have left. Um, we have the patch, I don't know if Rich is here, you know, we have Hello Reading. Um, but I think what we need to do is, is to have a uh, e more easily accessible public forum slash discussion board on the internet. That's the only way we can do it. Maybe not Facebook, maybe Facebook and in addition to you know, our town website. There's, and then the other thing, and we can go back to old school. I mean, you know, they, they call it the Washington Post because what we used to do is actually put news on a post. It used to actually be down in Reading Center. Start posting things down in town hall. I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of old school ways to do it. Uh, the, obviously, the new school, school ways to do it is to engage people through social media and, uh, and on our website. Um, we've done an okay job at that. We have to fill the, vo the void better because there is no newspaper here. I mean, I guess the Danbury News Times is kind of there. Um, but you know, one of the things that I'd like to see us talk about from the first selectman office and from any of the offices here is not about you know what, what we did or, or you know, what committees we're, we're gonna try and gather, it's what we're gonna do. What are we gonna do? What's the plan? And how will we execute the plan? We have not seen that in a long time on a number of fronts. And that's the thing that has to get communicated and tracked and, and people be held accountable for. Because if there's no plan, there's no progress. So whether you communicate it or not, nothing happens. Thank you. Another question has to do with Eversource. 
Well, I think Julie. I don't think I oh, sorry. I'm sorry. That question. Could you read the question? I'll again? read you the question. Right. See, that's bad communication. I'm moving right along. Yeah. I apologize. Right. Okay. This has to do with public communication. Yes. Given there is no daily or weekly newspaper, how will you improve reliable communication in our town to keep the citizens informed on important issues such as Gilbert and Bennett? Okay. So it is, it is certainly is an issue that we've lost the Reading Pilot. One of the things I frequently heard when we had the Reading Pilot was that no one was reading it. But certainly without it, we're feeling that. So what have I done as the first selectman to try to fill that void? Well, I have built almost every communication tool that the town currently has. I established the town's Facebook page. I established the town's Facebook group. I established the town's Instagram account, which is primarily a marketing effort. We have over 1,300 emails. We communicate on a daily basis about things that are going on in town from the town clerk's office. You do have to sign up to receive it. We do communicate. I also communicate about the Danbury News Times. So there are a number of efforts ongoing to begin to reestablish a newspaper. But the other thing I'd like to do more of are public forums. And in the last two years, quite frankly, that has been a challenge. In the past, we did do a series of public forums, and we're going to be holding another public forum here um, on October 12th to discuss a new ordinance on blight. Now, whether people agree with that or not, it will be our first public forum in almost two years. The Gilbert and Bennett Forum in April was virtual, and we had over 100 people on that meeting. More public forums are needed. Um, and to continue now doing the live broadcasts that so many people turn into, and using that as a method to reach people. Um, and during the budget and important meetings, doing mailings direct to households. But we have a lot of communication tools, and everyone likes to reach their, to get their information a different way. We have to work to do that. Thank you. The next question has to do with Eversource. And this, we'll start with Julia. Okay. As, as winter approaches, yes. we once again face the dread of power outages. What would you do to improve this often disappointing situation? Right. Okay. Well, let me tell you what we've done, and I think this is something that my opponent has missed. After Storm Isais, the town of Reading was second to file um, with the Pura docket a motion to compel Eversource to respond and to provide adequate crews to Reading. Many other communities jumped on board, Ridgefield, Bethel, Newtown, up and down the line. As a result of that action and the result of Pura hearings, um, record penalties were handed down to Eversource, capping their ability to make profits, um, restricting their ability until 2023 to put through new rate increases, and unfortunately, the worst part of this, however, is that the state just reached a settlement which Eversource, which will give homeowners a piddling $35 on average. But it's a start. We finally have in Melissa Gillette, a chairwoman of Pura, who is consumer friendly. Um, as far as how I handle our Eversource crises in town, I am 24-7 on this. We establish an EOC, and oftentimes, as my selectman can attest, I don't go home from the EOC until the last person has their power back. I am 24-7 on Facebook. I am all over the place. I am in touch with my contacts 24-7. People know they can reach me during a storm. I am demanding of Eversource, and I will continue to hold them accountable as Pura finally has and we are already seeing an improvement in their services to us in storm response. Thank you. Would you like me to ask the question again? Or are you? Sure. No, okay. No, I, no, I get it. I, get it. I, you got I, it. I understand it. No, the, uh, the response to Eversource and all our utility needs has been something that's been woefully lacking for quite a long time. I mean, when we had the big storm in 2012, I think it was, um, you know, the state, the entire state took up, uh, up in the legislature. Uh, we, we revamped the way uh, Eversource and how the utilities are supposed to respond to towns. Uh, things are supposed to get done at the local level and the state level. That needed to get repaired in 2016, had to get repaired in 2018. I was part of that. Uh, but one of the things that, that w was needed 
at all times was actually some pushback or, or a, a re-angling from the local level. And we haven't seen enough of that. Now, we finally find, yeah, after one of the research terms, we saw, we saw a little uh, DPUC or pure, uh, pure filing. There are hosts of filings, whether it's a sustain sustainability hearings, whether it's a capability hearing, whether it's a rate case. Just because we, we, what Julie's talking about, and it's a, nice, it's a nice first step. You check a box and you say, well, if you don't do X, you know, we're going we're gonna to push you back on your rates. But that's, that's, that's one step. There's like 15 tools at our disposal. And we should also use this not only against Eversource, but also against Optimum. Optimum, which serves most of this town, has been a woefully inadequate in providing a service both on the front end and on the back end in repair. We, in 2012 and 2014, when we had major storms and I was up in Hartford, uh, my Democratic uh, colleague and first selectman in Weston, Gail, uh, Gail Weinstein, was on top of it. She had command center, people here, and things were happening because she demanded it happen. When we had the storm a year or two ago, we didn't hear from anyone from town hall for days. For days, heard nothing. No one knew what was going on. That's got to stop, and there's yeah. two ways to do it. A, yeah. better communication response, uh, response here, and then start demanding responsiveness from the utilities now. Yeah. Proactive, not reactive. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. And this has to do with our seniors. Will you support with plans and funds enhancing the facilities, programs, and staff at the Heritage Center. Could you and repeat the I, question one more time? Will you support with plans and funds enhancing the facilities, programs, and staff at the Heritage Center? And I believe, John, you're the... Yeah, generally, yes. Generally speaking, yes. Obviously, we have to see the specifics of what the plans and the programs are, but I think the Heritage Center has been mostly a success. I think it should uh, stay on track as being a success because a fair amount of our population uses it. I'd also like to see it tie in a little better to some of the programs and population up in Meadow Ridge. I mean, we have a, we have a, a, a vast amount of people in Meadow Ridge. I mean, you know, last year it's been difficult because people have been kind of uh, hunkered down. Um, but some kind of joint uh, effort for what's going on in Meadow Ridge and Heritage. I know some of that stuff's happened. I think we can improve on that. Um, I, li I like what's happened at the Heritage Center. I like the discussion groups. I'd actually like to see some of the efforts and discussions and community activities that happen at the Heritage Center branch out of the Heritage Center and go up the hill to the, the elementary school, go across town to the middle school, and, and get a little more involved in what's going on at the high school. Because, you know, it's, it's, we, we have this fabulous resource of talented, educated, smart seniors who uh, we should use as a resource. So if we can support that with funding and programs, I'm in. I'm in. I mean, I think that's 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 one of the things that the selectmen, the first selectmen, particularly has control of. We've got a, you know, we got a 51 million dollar budget, and we only control about 15 million of it. Uh, and and part of that is the sewer plant, which we could talk about for hours. That's losing money. It's the senior center, which is uh, we could do a little better job on. It's cops and roads, and, and a couple and parks and rec. And those are the slots that we can fit in. Heritage Center is one of them, but we also have to focus on these other slots. There's funds out there. There's funds out there. To, we have the funds to raise, but we also need to manage it better. And we, it, Thank you. Yeah. Julia? Thank you. So the short answer is absolutely yes, um, supporting the growth in the Heritage Center. That was actually one of the first things I took on. Um, the first, uh, again, reorganization of the Heritage Center, which was woefully inadequate with no programs and a miserable commission on aging. And I think I see some of you here in the audience. So we, um, we made a change in staff. We hired a licensed clinical social worker. We hired uh, program staff. We gave uh, program staffing responsibilities to people who were actually um, qualified to do it, and we now have a thriving heritage center with programs that are growing. So we are going to have to look at space needs. Um, so this is a real success story, the Heritage Center, and certainly um, they have a lot of programs that have actually been expanded to folks who don't traditionally classify themselves as seniors, um, you know, folks my age. So we're going to have to take a look at the community center, um, how the community center meets the needs of not only our seniors, but also of our youth and our youth programs. Um, this structure is essentially an office building with a few extra rooms. Um, so yes, absolutely supportive of that, but we need to take a look at it holistically. We have a lot of aging facilities. I've reorganized the facilities committee so that we can begin to address these long-term planning will become absolutely essential and not just 10 years but 20 years down the road as our population in georgetown grows and um and reading is changed by a large influx of people um, 
So, yes. Thank you. And now is time for closing statement. You each have one minute. And Julia, you're the first one here. All right. Okay. So uh, it has been my pleasure to serve this community as an elected official for 20 years, starting first with the Region 9 Board of Education, then on to the Board of Selectmen, and for the last eight years as your first selectman. During that time, I've consolidated, cost-reduced, enhanced town services in a way that have touched every department in town hall. Critically important is the time I've spent and the knowledge gained in the successful victory of title to the Georgetown wire mill property. All of these initiatives have improved the quality of life in Reading and restarted the future of Georgetown. I have a passion for our town and a successful record of leading Reading, its operations, and the men and women who deliver its ser services, all within a rigorous, rigorously vetted budget. For about five of my eight years, we've had no tax increases. We run surpluses almost every year in our selectmen's operating budget. Um, we now have $250,000 in revenue to supplant uh, the town's resources. And uh, if you'd like a more complete history, please go to juliapemberton.com. I ask for your vote on November 2nd. Thank you. Thank you. John? Yes. Uh, with, with your indulgence, I'm, it's sort of a habit from Catholic school. When I run a address the audience, I was taught to stand up or I got hit by a ruler, so I apologize if that's the case. Uh, listen, thank you for everybody coming. Uh, we appreciate it. I, I uh, appreciate Julia's service. That's right. I appreciate Julia's service. I appreciate everybody in the, everyone in this room has, sir, here we go. Come on. Kumbaya. <laughs> Kumbaya. Get a picture. <laughs> Everyone, almost everyone in this room has had something positive uh, to do with the town of Reading, and that's great, and I applaud that because the people who come here are interested. But there's one th closing message for me. There's no Republican way to pave a road. There's no Democratic way to catch a dog. There's no partisan way to build a budget. What there is is an effective way to learn, build teams, and advance. Well, what's been happening in the last six and eight years is we've been treading water. We've been treading water. Haven't, gone back, haven't really gone backwards on a lot of things. That's good. But we've been treading water. There's been no advancement down in Georgetown. There's been a little or no advancement in other areas. I don't have a learning curve because of my experience in Hartford and my experience as a lawyer and my experience as an environmental or environmental lawyer with a construction degree. I can, I can hit the ground running day one. I don't need a committee. I don't need, I don't need a, a, a blue ribbon panel. We can start moving forward now. I thank everyone for coming. Anyone has any questions? Check out our Facebook page. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And um, we're now going to ask the Board of Selectmen, Margaret Peg O'Donnell and Michael Thompson, to come to the dais. Thank you. While they're getting ready, I just want to let those who are here, if you have questions that you want to ask, please submit them to the reviewers in the back of the room, and they will determine whether or not they can add that to the list of questions that I'm now using. Thank you. Okay, we now have Margaret, known as Peg O'Donnell, who is the Democratic First Selectman. Not no. first selectman, no, selectman. No, 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 no. Sorry. I got scared there. Second, third. <laughs> the, the selectman, Margaret Peg O'Donnell, is a Democratic um, candidate. And then Michael Thompson is the Republican candidate. And as you know, you heard about the way the election runs, so be um, care careful in your listening as to um, wh how you view each of the candidates. Okay, these are different questions. First one has to do with uh, speed limits. In the 12 years since I've lived in town, 
I have noticed an uptick in aggressive driving, speeding, and tailgating. I also see many large trucks using cross highway who do not have business on the road, despite no through, through truck signs. There seems to be little to no enforcement of speed limits and rules of the road. What would you change? We'll start with you, Peg. Well, first of all, our police department actually does do a lot of speed enforcement. You may not see it as, as someone sitting there with a radar gun, but we do have speed signs that are put out. We have a police chief who is incredibly proactive and helps when, if, if you call there, if you tell them, you know, there's people speeding on my street. They actually will put the sign out and they'll take a look at that. Um, Michael and I have both seen those reports many, many times. And are there people speeding? Yes, there are. But I think what we have to realize as taxpayers and residents in this town is that we don't have enough police officers to be on every street all the time to catch someone who's speeding. We do the best that we can, and we have officers who are out to do that. Uh, you know, we're limited to the number of police officers that we can have on the street at one time. We're limited by budgets. So if the reality is that, that more people want more speed enforcement, we will need more police officers. Michael? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for having us tonight and for everyone who helped organize this event. Thank you for coming. My name is Michael Thompson. I've been a member of the Board of Selectmen for the past eight years and did some other things in town before that. I'm an attorney as well, and I've had some experience um, dealing with some of the issues that Peg just addressed, particularly I know over the past couple of years, it has seemed like speeding has, has, has increased. I think a lot of that may have been the last year because we all started ramping up again, and the streets got a little more crowded than they had been. So there's a perception issue, I think, that seems to be the forefront of people's minds. But certainly, speeding has become an issue. Peg mentioned that we've seen some data. Uh, Chief O'Donnell and his, and his crew have been putting up speed signs and tracking various places where they've been asked to put them up. And it's interesting, the data shows that while there are some outliers, both speeding and going slower than the speed limit, the majority of people <laughs> that actually go through those areas turn out to be traveling within five miles per hour up or down the speed limit. So we're trying to figure out where the hot spots are in town, put the resources there to see what, what what's going on actually, and try to figure out a way to work to make sure that those areas can be better patrolled. But as Peg said, we're limited the number of people we can have on the road at any one time. And I think if, we, if the community is concerned about this issue, excuse me, this issue, then we have to talk about whether or not we need to increase either uh, the number of police officers or create some kind of traffic enforcement sub-level or something like that. But there's a limited budget in Reading, obviously, in there, and we've got to do what we can do with what we have. Thank you. The next question will begin with you, Michael. Residents of the town of Reading have been increasingly divided in the last couple of years. Do you think uniting the town is the responsibility of the selectmen? And if so, what would you do to unite the town? It's a great question. I think, as, as John Shaben mentioned, I'm sure other people feel this way. I've been to town for about 18 or 19 years. My wife and I came. Um, and the town has changed a great deal. I think it's grown. To, for the positive on many, on many, for many reasons, and negatively, recently particularly. And I, I, I think we all have to decide how we want to treat each other and how to res uh, respond to each other, how to deal with issues together. I'm not really sure that this place is really divided. It just seems that way to a great degree because of, I, I think it's driven by social media. I've, I, I've made comments three or four times over the course of the eight years on social media, and every time I did, I left feeling very unsatisfied because I think most people who jump on there and try to engage um, respectfully, I think it's very difficult to do that sometimes because I, I think people are, you know, there's some important issues floating around out there. We've all had a tough couple of years, and it creates, it creates a lot of anxiety, and I think people have expressed themselves on social media in ways they wouldn't do in person, I don't think, I think the lack of a newspaper is, is really too bad because I know responsible editors wouldn't publish letters to the editor using words that some people have been using on social media with each other. So I would encourage people to stay off social media and I would encourage everybody who's a town employee, a public official, an appointed official 
to kind of calm down a little bit and try to help each other out and figure out what's the best way forward. I think we're a good group of people here, and we're all here right here talking about it, so that's a pretty good sign. Peg? I think Michael knows what he's talking about. <laughs> I've and been working I would, with you for a while, Peg. So. I, and I would point out that the two of us sitting here will probably agree on most of the yes, things I think that's probably that we right. discussed tonight. That's probably right. And we are from opposite sides of the aisle, so just take that home with you. Realize that in a lot of ways, we really need to listen to each other. We find out that we agree on much more than we disagree about. And that is something... I mean, what can the selectmen do? I think we're doing it, honestly. I think we're showing that we can work together, we can be collaborative, we can get things done. Um, I certainly agree that staying off social media is a great idea. I think we all have to realize every time we write something on social media, we should think, is my mother going to read that? <laughs> and you know, if you start, and by the way, if my mother read it, I'd be in so much trouble. So, but I think that's part of what we all have. We have to hold ourselves accountable. And I believe that on the Board of Selectmen, we already do that. So thank you. Okay, this will start with you, Peg. There are two questions, but they all deal with Parks and Rec and Heritage Center, so they're going to be, I'm going to combine them. You can answer both. Um, will you support with plans and funds enhancing the facilities at Heritage? And along those lines, what's your vision for the Parks and Rec Department? Well, I think that the, the Heritage Center and the Parks and Rec are really kind of pieces of the same thing. It's recreation for people in all ages of our town. Um, Park and Rec is not just for children. Park and Rec is Topstone. Park and Rec is, you know, a lot of activities that a lot of people can take part in. The Heritage Center is something that, you know, has been set up to take care of needs of people who are older, but they really, a lot of those things kind of dovetail together. Uh, at, at the Board of Selectmen level, what we tend to do, and we'll start doing this in the next couple of months, is you know, talking to boards and commissions and talking to departments within town as well to say, you know, it's time to start talking about budgets. First, let's talk about our wish list. And sometimes on that wish list, there are things that even the department thinks they can't have. And you know, sometimes we say, no, you know what? That seems like something we really should be doing. Let's figure out how to do it. So I think that Parks and Rec and Heritage Center, you know, it, it's part of a broader discussion of where the town's going and how do we take care of all of our residents to make sure that they have a recreation, something that they can do, that they enjoy doing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I, I think, Michael? Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree. I think Peg summarized the process very clearly, and I think it's an important one. As, as she describes, the budget process starts within the town departments. They start putting them together so that by January there's a proposal. First, uh, the Board of Selectmen looks through those proposals and meets several times during the months uh, after that subsequently and tries to produce a budget that uh, represents what we feel is a responsible one, and we present it to the Board of Finance who then decides whether or not it makes sense or whether we need to go back and, and uh, whether that's the right number and we have to do some more tweaking. But I think we've spent a great deal of time in the past few years focusing on the Heritage Center. There's much more to do as our population ages. Um, and I think uh, it's a great resource in town. There's a lot of, there's a lot of excellent people uh, working there. And then the Commission on Aging, Mary Del Lancaster and others have, have done a great job of, of making recommendations as part of the budget process. Kevin Jones and his group on Park and Rec Kevin's an excellent guy in that role. He's done a great job. So if people are interested in these issues particularly and have something to, that they want to add to the conversation, I would encourage them to get involved in the Commission on Aging or go to those meetings. Uh, go to the Park and Rec meetings. They're once a month, the first Monday of the month. And uh, either get involved or uh, make some suggestions because I think the, uh, they're very good groups. They provide a lot of opportunities for people in town. And um, uh, you know, more, the more heads, the better, I think. Thank you. The next question. 
What are the most important steps to take now in getting the Gilbert and Bennett project restarted? And what do you think the focus should be? I think we're starting. I think that's me. With Michael. Yes. Colleen, yes. You know what? This was, I, I enjoyed the first selectman debate on this one because there's obviously a will to get stuff done now in Georgetown. There's a great deal of excitement about what can be done. From my perspective as, as a lawyer and having been part of the team that kind of worked on this for a long time and developed a strategy to put it in place, it was very satisfying to see that that legal strategy won. Um, but I would, I would say from my perspective, um, there's an issue of bond debt that still plagues the property and limits, restricts what we can actually do. I think my, my first priority would be to figure out how to eliminate that or reduce it to a certain extent whether through negotiations with the primary bondholders or through some kind of legislative fix. That's, we've, we've looked at a lot of this. Some of it is very difficult to do, and we're not quite sure, but if we did do it, it would extinguish the debt. So I think ultimately there's probably going to have to be some kind of deal cut to get that done, and I think we've got the, 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 the talent in place and the people involved. I can certainly help others to get it done. Um, that's number one. Number two, I think we need to have some kind of you know, project management professionals involved fairly soon. Um, you know, and it may be that uh, as part of that process, perhaps instead of a, 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 a just a, a first selectman driven uh, municipal government, maybe you should have a town manager driven uh, uh, town government in order to have some, some consistency because we've got, you know, any one of us could not get elected next time around or this time around and a brain drain would happen automatically. So, uh, and, and finally, I think um, we just need to figure out a way to budget and account for Georgetown related issues. Julia mentioned revenues coming in. We need to budget, build that into the, into the uh, budget for the year and have accounting of what's going on so everybody understands what's going on and feels comfortable with it. Thank you. Peg? I like listening to him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that uh, I'm, I'm not an attorney, okay? So um, I'm an accountant, so I look at things a little bit differently sometimes. Um, I think what everyone in town has to understand is that this project, there's so many pieces to it and so much going on and so much that was going on in the legal end that Michael understands so well that it may look to you that nothing is happening, let me assure you, that is not true. There are all kinds of things that are happening now. We're, we're working on planning. We really have to update what's going on environmentally on that piece of property. We have to update what is possible. And we are working on that, but a lot of this stuff is kind of mundane. It's not sexy, it's not interesting, it doesn't involve bricks, but it involves the building blocks that we need to make sure that when this property is done, it will be something that we are all proud of, that our children will say, man, they did the right thing. That takes time. And we are committed to taking the time that it needs while we continue to move it forward. Thank you. The next question, start with Peg. How will you lead Reading into the 5G generation? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm a little bit old, so, I, you know, th that's a rather technical issue that, um, to be completely honest with you, I, I, how will we lead into that? There's a lot of questions about how that's going to happen. And to be honest with you, it's not an issue that I am really that far up on. So there will be people with more technical abilities that will know how to do that. And I could tell you anything, but it wouldn't really do any good. So I'm going to let you have it. I think I probably know less about this than Peg. <laughs> I go to her for these issues all the time and try to get a better explanation about them. But uh, I, I think the person who ever asked that question, we need you somewhere involved in this project. <laughs> OK. Going back to the issue um, that we raised earlier, the question is, how would you begin to have a dedicated enforcement team for those speeding problems. <laughs> mm. 
I guess I brought that up, huh, Peg? Yeah, I guess you did. Uh, it's my turn. Now I, I want to see what you're going to yeah, do. Yeah, I don't have no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> I, th I, th I think seriously. I think we would have to we would have to have some kind of discussion publicly initially with whether or not uh, that, it, obviously in cons consultation with with Chief O'Donnell and his team, to figure out if that's something that can be done. I don't know. You know, I was kind of thinking off the top of my head there. I get in trouble sometimes. I don't really mean to do that. But I guess my point was, if there was a way to do it cost effectively to help sub supplement what our police officers can do during the course of the day, we should explore it. And I think if we, if, if it's a possibility, not knowing what the particular regulations are specifically about whether or not something like this is possible, or what it would take to do that. I guess my point is, if there's if there's something we can do to help the police department and address this this issue, then we should try to figure out what that might be. And, uh, you know, um, but we would have to have law enforcement input into that and understand exactly what the ramifications are before yeah. making a recommendation. Excuse me. I, I'm thinking we have those constables. Yeah, right. <laughs> got to quell some riots. Right? Yeah, good call. Right? We've got them already. They're elected <laughs> officials. We can use them. Um, I mean, that would be a discussion, it's true, with, with our police chief um, finding out what he would recommend as far as increasing that kind of um, speed enforcement. And obviously, we, there would be a lot of things we'd have to talk about. There's unions involved. There's all kinds of things like that. But if that is an issue that people are interested in, they need to let us know, and then it can be acted upon. And that goes really for any issue that you have this is the time, as, as you've heard both of us say, that we're starting to think about budgets for the next year. If there's something that you want in that budget, don't wait till March, it's too late. You need to speak up now and say what's important to you. And we will certainly listen to all of those things. So don't hesitate. Okay, it, last it, question. Colin, can I just say real quick? Uh, Peg reminded me something. I think, I think in this discussion, we put up a number of signs for no through trucks. We've had some discussions publicly with the chief about that. I think a lot of trucks are finding their way through Reddings when they didn't used to because of GPS. I think that's a lot of it, right? And, and how, do we, how do we figure out a way to manage that process? Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, Peg, this is for you to start. This is really addressing your views with respect to having no daily or weekly newspaper. How will you, or how do you think we should improve reliable communication in our town to keep the citizens informed? I think that, first of all, citizens have to be part of the answer. That means that citizens have to sign up for the alerts that come out from the town. They are also, you know, there'll be alerts on things that are important and, you know, maybe time sensitive to this day. But then on Thursday, from, through the town clerk's office, there's this great newsletter that goes out, and it tells you all kinds of stuff that's going on. Not just things that are, not just zoning meetings and board of selectmen meetings. Things like Georgetown Day. Things like, uh, things that are going on at the library. So that's one way for people to get that information. Also, you know, we do have Hello Reading, we have Patch, we have Hamlet Hub, we have the Danbury News Times. The Danbury News Times can also be delivered to you electronically. You don't even have to get the paper if that's your concern. But citizens in town have to also be the people who go out and seek that information. It, it, we, there, there's only so much we can do to shove it down your throat. You have to ask for it too. Michael. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Peg, and I, I think, you know, one of the things if that's positive about the pandemic, if anything can be considered that, is there's been a lot more engagement through Zoom in town meetings, and most all of them now post a Zoom link, I think. Uh, I know we went back this summer to per, uh, in-person meetings. We also had a Zoom capability, and we've obviously had Facebook, or, uh, Bob's feed that Julia initiated uh, several years ago we first came in involved, I think. If you've, if you've got an interest in a, a town department or an issue, uh, find out when the, re the relevant commission or board is meeting and hop on, you know, hit the Zoom link and grab a beer and watch. <laughs> <laughs> you, may need, you may need to. We're the fun board. Oh, yeah, right. We're the fun board, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, now it's time for your one minute closing statement and we'll start with Michael. Uh, well, thanks thanks to the league and to uh, Colleen for organizing and conducting this event. Really appreciate it. Again, thanks everybody for turning out. Um, I've been uh, appreciated having the opportunity to be a, a member of the Board of Select in the past eight years. If I were to be reelected, I would try my best to represent the town and work cooperatively with my colleagues to uh, advance its interests. We've done a lot in eight years on the board. I've been particularly proud of a couple of things. The first and foremost really is, is we kind of restructured the police and hired a new police chief who takes the department's interests ahead of his own day in and day out. He's, he's, a, he's a blessing. I'm glad Mark's there. Um, second, uh, Georgetown, we created a strategy. We now have much better control of the property than we did. That's very, very important. And finally, I think we put together responsible budgets that meet the town needs and hopefully provide value to the taxpayers. I want, uh, we mentioned this before, this is a decent place with decent people in it. I'm very proud to be a member of the Board of Selectmen. If, if I'm given the opportunity, I'll be grateful for it. And I hope I've earned your support. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Peg? As you can tell, this is a little bit of a love fest up here. Um, the present Board of Selectmen has been working in a nonpartisan manner to handle administrative town duties, answer questions of taxpayers and residents, and to gather information so that taxpayers and residents can make informed decisions on the future of our town. In the last five years, that's the period of time that I've been on the Board of Selectmen, we've worked to co consolidate town departments, keep our tax increases modest or at zero, secure that Gilbert and Bennett to property development will be under town control, maintain the town's open space leadership, and assure that there are recreational options for all residents. Do the, and we also we do the everyday work of repairing roads and keeping our police department in good order. I'm proud to say that this board works collaboratively to be sure that the needs of all town residents and taxpayers are met. I ask that you maintain the present Board of Selectmen for two more years. We've worked hard for you, and we ask you to turn out for us on November 2nd. I think I speak on behalf of not only the League, but our town. Thank you for your many years of service. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask the Board of Finance candidates to come forth. Welcome. We are now have the Board of Finance debate. And I will introduce in order. Ward Mazuko is the Republican candidate. Raise your hand. <laughs> Karen Gifford is the Democratic candidate. And Christopher Parkin is the Democratic candidate. Okay. You know the routine here, right? <laughs> okay. I'm going to start with Ward. Over the years, members of the Board of Finance have had primarily finance and accounting backgrounds. Others have had managerial professional backgrounds. Both are critical to the mission of the Board. Considering your own background, what will you contribute to that important mix of skills? <clears throat> well, it has been a very successful mix, and you're absolutely right that having financial professionals, accountants, lawyers, business people, and so forth has been a real benefit uh, to our uh, Board of Finance. In my particular case, I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing more than 40 years. Uh, I work in the areas of business, commercial real estate, and related litigation. And many of these topics have come up uh, over the years, uh, both in terms of the Georgetown project on which we've been briefed a number of times, and also in developing various policies that our, um, uh, that our Board of Finance has developed over the years. I've assisted in drafting a number of those initiatives. Uh, in addition to that, um, I like to say that as a lawyer, I'm in the dispute resolution business. And that often, it means being an advocate when you have to be, but it also probably more importantly means bridging gaps, listening to both sides, building consensus, and trying to get people on the same page. And I think that by <clears throat> listening to my colleagues and helping to bridge 
uh, the gaps and reach consensus consensuses uh, at our meetings, I think that that has been a valuable service. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Karen? I am a finance professional. I was an investment banker, principally in the municipal finance area for quite a long time, 35 years or so. Um, and that, I think, is a skill that's particularly suited to the Board of Finance. Um, I don't know that others, the other skills that you've mentioned aren't useful. They are. Managerial, uh, we don't, I don't think, have anybody in that category at the moment. Um, but the Board of Finance is a Board of Finance. It has to make tough decisions. It needs to um, collaborate with various town boards. Uh, and that's something I've done for quite a long time and, and been quite successful at doing. Uh, a skill to put competing, um, competing interests together is one of the ones that I think will be very helpful in, this, uh, in the endeavor of, of the uh, Board of Finance. Thank you. Christopher. Hi. Thank you, Colleen. And first, thank you to Colleen for moderating tonight and for the League for organizing this debate under difficult COVID circumstances. And thank you for everybody for coming out tonight under those circumstances. Uh, like Ward, I'm a practicing attorney. Ward's been practicing for almost 40 years. I've been alive for almost 40 years. <laughs> that, beyond that. Uh, Let's keep this civil. <laughs> The, the, the question is about what my background will bring to the position, and I think that background goes beyond professional qualifications. I could line up a bunch of lawyers who would bring similar perspective to the board, but I couldn't line up a bunch of Board of Education chairmen who could bring that perspective to the board. Nor could I bring the perspective of somebody who, has parent, who is a parent of children in our <coughs> schools right now as a perspective to the board. And over the years, a, a point of friction between the Board of Finance and the Board of Education in our town has been really translating the reality of public education in the 21st century to, uh, to a board of finance without a real present lived experience in that world. And having lived through a, a decade of experience as a parent of, of children in the school and four years in the board of education working through repeated budget processes, I understand what it takes to have a quality public education system, and I understand how to translate the budget request to my colleagues on the Board of Finance to understand what the puts and takes are and why it is that they're ultimately important. And I think that background and that representation ultimately matters as we move forward into the 21st century. Thank you. The next question, we're going to start, Karen, you will start mm -hmm. in, in answering. <clears throat> Reading is expected to receive nearly $2.8 million in the American Rescue Act funds. What role should the Board of Finance play in establishing the manner in which the town disperses these funds, and how would you advise the town to allocate these funds? We've talked about having a, Julia has talked about putting together a group of people that includes Board of Finance, but also includes Board of Ed, uh, members of the public, Board of Selectmen, to deal with the competing um, uh, requests, shall we say, for ARPA money. There are some rules we have to live with uh, that the feds have set up, but clearly economic development is a critical piece, um, and affordable housing is a contender, I believe. Uh, perhaps the senior center is a contender. Uh, schools and education, particularly school buildings, may be a contender. But until everybody comes to the table, it's difficult to see how many competing uh, uh, needs there are and then how we can creatively fit those needs into what the feds are telling us we're allowed to do with the money. We have until the end of 2024 to spend it, so there is a bit of time for us to sort out those competing needs. Thank you. Christopher. Thank you, Colleen. The American Recovery Act <coughs> funds <coughs> present part of a generational opportunity for our community, as does the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our community. Anybody who's been paying attention for the past two years has seen an influx of new residents to our community. 
they're new residents with different needs and different expectations. They are folks who are now entering a world where they might be working from home forever. And their expectations are going to be different, and the way that our community looks, feels, and behaves is going to be different. And I think that we need to be very mindful of what the ARPA money is for and use it for targeted relief to those who are impacted by the, by the pandemic and to shore up and, frankly, put gasoline onto the fire of reinvigorating our community and providing resources and opportunity for folks who now are effectively working from home forever or you know, our new neighbors from Brooklyn who are now living in Brooklyn North here in Reading. What it shouldn't be used for is routine maintenance and uh, and items that and, and budgetary items that should be taken care of in, as a matter of course. The ARP money should not be used to paint this building. The ARP money should not be used to uh, to do routine maintenance in school buildings or to fix the boardwalk across the street. The ARPA money should be used for its purpose, which is, as Karen said, going to be governed by strict rules from from Washington, but to target relief for our community and to help position ourselves for the future and to grow as a community. Thank you. <clears throat> Ward. Thanks, Colleen. <clears throat> yeah, I agree with much of what uh, Karen and Christopher said. Uh, the first order of business is to find out what exactly we can spend the money on. What are those legal constraints imposed by the federal government? We do need that committee that uh, I think Julia is trying to set up. Uh, involving the various constituencies, Board of Ed, Board of Finance, Board of Selectmen, uh, members of the public, uh, and so forth. Uh, but this is a unique opportunity uh, to invest in the future of our, uh, of our town. Uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, broadband, uh, 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 internet, not that I know any more about 5G than PEG does. Uh, <laughs> Uh, improving uh, our recreational facilities, our school facilities, our, our senior facilities. All of that is on the table, but we really do have to get input from a lot of sources, prioritize, and most importantly, move, move the ball forward. Thank you. Thank you. Nick? Next question. I think we can hold applause because it's <laughs> nice that everyone's talking. It's very nice, but let's wait till the end of the uh, questions. Thank you. Um, next question is going to begin with you, Christopher. Um, Reading provides a very generous senior tax credit. The credit costs taxpayers approximately $2 million per year. How important is the senior tax credit to Reading, and would you propose any changes going forward? So, the senior tax credit first is a third rail in Reading politics, but it's one that I think we have to address and have a conversation about. It is by far the most generous amongst our peer towns, and it is likely the most generous in the state of Connecticut. Uh, for practical purposes, for every dollar that is raised to pay for the budget, we need to raise a dollar and four in taxes to pay for the senior tax credit. I think that we can learn a lot from how our peer towns handle uh, elderly tax relief, whether it's capping the annual amount, whether it's means testing, which is almost universal, and wealth testing, which is almost universal. But I think that what we have to understand is the purpose of the senior tax credit and figure out what we can do to, to balance the bona fide need to provide that relief to seniors in the community. Because the topic comes up frequently, as Karen touched upon, which is affordable housing. How do you allow seniors to, find, to affordably maintain their residences in, in the town of Reading? And part of that is tax relief. But part of that is also providing affordable housing opportunities, either through the incentive housing zone and encouraging that type of development in the Georgetown project, or through providing, uh, you know, through zoning, broader ability to have accessible dwelling units, granny flats, pod housing, and other ways to age in place comfortably in town in a way that doesn't have the same uh, material impact on, on our taxes that the elderly tax credit does. Thank you. Chris is absolutely right. It is the third rail of politics. I think Ward's up next. Oh. You can take my <laughs> answer if you like. I didn't say, I didn't, I didn't say, it, it's oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I don't. Do you want me to Ward, do you want to proceed? Right <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, um, I, I guess the you know the question itself uh, assumes a premise that may not be quite correct. It talks about how much the tax credit costs taxpayers, and indeed seniors are entitled to some savings in their taxes. But you have to look at the overall effect on our community. 
it's expensive to send children to school. On average, we spend about $30,000 per student in Reading, and that is at the high end of what any other uh, Durgay community spends. Durgay being the cohort of towns that we uh, are socioeconomically connected with. And when my kids went through the Reading schools, all three of my kids went K through 12 in Reading, um, I'm sure my taxes didn't cover what my kids cost other taxpayers. Um, fortunately, there were seniors in town at that point whose demand on town service was, services was far lower. They may have, they may have saved a thousand or two a year in their property taxes, but it enabled my kids to go through school and I'm grateful for that. And so it really is a symbiotic relationship. It's not really a burden on the community as the question might suggest. Um, and the final point I'd make is that eight years ago, there was a proposal to tinker with a ta tax credit. And right in this room, uh, the voters voted it down decisively. It's a very difficult topic because there are so many moving parts that I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Karen. Well, it is the third rail. Um, and as you just pointed out, uh, Ward, it has to pat whatever happens needs to be uh, voted on by the voters of Reading. Um, there are some ways to tinker around the edges of it. Uh, you could perhaps deal with the age eligibility and make it equal to uh, when you're eligible for Social Security. Or uh, you, might, um, you might try to grandfather people so that they would be willing to vote uh, to, to make these kinds of changes. But as Ward points out, there is a flip side to the, to, the, uh, to the tax credit, and that is that it does make it possible for people who couldn't, uh, who, who's, whose property taxes don't support the cost of their children in school, um, and we'd like to keep it that way. Uh, these are people, many of them, who have uh, been here for quite a long time and have contributed to the community in other ways as well. Last point, your point about affordable housing is right on. We, if we had senior housing of some sort, affordable, it would make a big difference. Thank you. Next question, we start with Ward, he'll be the first. In your opinion, what are the town's top three priorities, and what will you do as a member of the Board of Finance to help achieve them? Well, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't put Georgetown near the top, at the top of the list. Uh, as you've heard at some length tonight, Georgetown is the key to many things in Reading. It may be the key to everything from our affordable housing to sustaining school enrollment to sustaining increasing the commercial tax base. It can really do a lot for our community, but it's a very uh, difficult and nuanced issue. We've made progress by winning that foreclosure and taking title to the property, but there's a lot more to do. And fortunately, with a legal background and having a Board of Finance involved in this uh, process going forward, I think I am able to uh, work with the team of town officials that will take on that challenge. Uh, another challenge is, is really just keeping our budgets uh, under control. It's easy to lose track of the effect of incremental uh, increases each year. Yes, we've kept taxes flat in many recent years, but often through, uh, uh, shall we say, some fiscal um, uh, maneuvering that I, I'm not totally on board with. And the, uh, we have to be vigilant about the town budget and the school budget and, and be careful in setting our priorities. Thank you. Karen? Clearly, Georgetown is the, the critical piece here. Um, a commercial tax base that is increased will solve quite a lot of the uh, problems and or issues that we see. Uh, and the problem really is that it's going to be some time before the effect of development in Georgetown, whatever that development 
might wind up to being in the end uh, is going to have a financial impact. There are some shorter term economic development things we can do, some of them perhaps with the help of some ARPA funds. Uh, Georgetown, as it stands today, uh, can use some help. And there is some development potential, and I think some activity even, on that little piece of, uh, of Route 7 that we control. So things that will help to increase town revenue are critical, and that uh, that would be at the top of my of my list. Uh, responsible budgets, absolutely important, uh, and how we deal with the needs of the schools in that regard is important because the schools are critical to the, the health and safety, well, not safety so much, I suppose, but certainly the health of the town, uh, and we need to support them. Kristen. Okay. Thank you. I think, obviously, Georgetown is the elephant in the room, but I'm not sure it's one of the top three immediate priorities facing the town because, as Karen said, it sets a medium or long-term problem that can't be tackled in the immediate term. And I think that the three most important things facing the town through the Board of Finance at this point are coordination as between operating units, capital planning, and taking deliberate steps to sustain investments that have already been made in our community, including our schools. The first comes down to coordination. Some will recall that two years ago, the town invested in a study by the Greenwich Leadership Partners who came in and talked to members of different boards and commissions and came to the conclusion, as I think all of us who sat through those interviews did, that the town is, is siloed and has a tough time really breaking through those silos to cooperate. And as a result, there's a lot of efficiency lost and frankly, there's a lot of tax dollars lost in, in living in a siloed, siloed world. And I think we could all do better to, to work collaboratively Board of Selectmen, the two boards of education, the Board of Finance, and the Planning Commission that has put together our long-range plan for our town. That dovetails into capital planning, which is an on-again, off-again topic of different levels of transparency. The schools and the town need to be on the same page as to what we're doing in year one, year three, year five, year 10, and year 20. Until we do that, we live in an incremental budgeting world where every year we're fighting over the margins and the pennies in our budgets instead of tying things to long-term goals and having a clear idea of what we're spending and why, which translates into the third, which is sustaining the investments we've already made and not getting lost in the weeds in the annual budget process. Thank you. Uh, Karen, the next question starts with you and uh, deals with the schools. Reading has a limited tax base which puts pressure on the town's budget, especially the school's budget. What would you contribute to the Board of Finance to successfully navigate this narrow path to keep our fine schools strong? Collaboration is critical in building any budget, and it's particularly important with respect to the school budget. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Chris, I think, has been a terrific advocate for the school budget. Uh, and the transparency of the school budget is, I think, the difficult thing for quite a lot of people. Certainly, it has been for me. Um, we need to support excellent schools. There's no question about it. We need to invest what we need to invest to make sure that that happens. Uh, but we need truly to understand what it is we're spending and what we're getting. Um, it would be terrific, for example, if we knew how a particular group of children had progressed from September to June in class, you know, in the fourth grade, let's just say. Uh, because that's a whole, much, whole lot better indicator, I think, than, gosh, the cost per student is X or some other um, financial metric. Um, the long-term planning piece that Chris is talking about is also a piece of that, uh, because we don't know. Uh, from year to year exactly what it's going to take uh, in terms of capital or uh, in terms of um, the number of students to keep the schools as successful as they currently are. Done. Thank you, Christopher. I think that when it comes to the question of what would I bring to the Board of Finance as it relates to managing the schools and, and managing the, the limited tax base, Four years in the Board of Education, two years as the school board chair, 
many years of living in the weeds of school budgets. Um, if Karen has any particular questions, I'm happy to give you chapter and verse <laughs> on, on every line that's in that budget. And I think that it's critically important to have a voice on the Board of Finance that understands how that budget is built, what it funds, and why, and where the areas are for discussion and where the areas are that simply aren't for discussion. And to the extent that there's a question of transparency, I think that the school budget has been posted online regularly. It is many, many lines deep. It is as transparent as we can, can make it for a complicated <coughs> document. Um, I think that it is my experience with the school budget on a day-to-day -day basis is a skill set that is unique amongst the three of us that I can bring to the, the Board of Finance and help keep an understanding of what it is that is important to keep the schools functioning with recognizing that we have a limited tax base. And as Karen said, we cannot get caught up in in cost per pupil, whether it's $3,000 or $30,000. The reality is we have aging infrastructure and we have a diminished enrollment and that leads to an increased cost per pupil, but it doesn't change the quality of education or the needs that we have for the students that are having that building every day. Thank you. Ward? Thank you. <clears throat> well, I think uh, one problem that Chris identified is the siloing. Uh, that, that is a good point. And improving c communication among town leaders on various boards and commissions would serve to uh, strengthen schools and strengthen the budget process. Uh, it's been a challenge in, throughout all my 12 years on the board. There has been uh, a certain level of, of friction, which if you read the papers, you see goes on in every town uh, in the area when it comes to budget time. Um, but in it, returning to a point that Karen made, it's not just what we spend. It's also what we get. There's no, not enough time tonight to go through all the various metrics that show that we spend disproportionately to our income in this community uh, for schools when compared to our peer uh, DERG A schools, which would be understandable if the results were commensurate with that expenditure. But unfortunately, it's not. And if I were a parent, listening in tonight, my question wouldn't be, why aren't we spending more on the budget? It would be, why aren't we getting more for our dollar? There is an important uh, 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 question to be asked in that regard. And, you know, to paraphrase the guiding principle at Joel Barlow, uh, education is not the filling of a bucket, but uh, lighting a fire. Well, here, it's not the spending of money, it's the de dedicated effort of parents and teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, you'll all now have a minute for a closing statement, but I just want to thank you for your time, effort, and your willingness to serve our community. And let's start with Christopher. Thank you, Colleen. Um, and thank you again to the League and everybody for coming out tonight. Before I jump into the, the, the meat of the, the statement, I just wanted to clarify a point that I think is important with respect to this race, which is also a little bit confusing, just like the first Selectman's race is. And that is that because of minority representation, you're looking at three candidates running for two seats. Ward's seat is effectively assured, and so Karen and I are effectively running against each other. So as a practical matter, if you vote for both of us, you vote for neither of us. So I'm, I'm here tonight to ask for, for your, your vote with an understanding of sort of that playing field. And I'm running for this, this office because I think ultimately that representation matters. I think that my perspective is an important one that is not seen on the Board of Finance right now and has not been seen for many years on the Board of Finance. Our town is at the beginning of a transformational change. We are cha our economy has changed, the world in which we live has changed, and the people moving to this town have changed. And we need to be prepared to meet those, those needs, and we need the perspective of somebody who is a, a parent with children in the schools and who understands education to help translate those needs on the Board of Finance. Thank you. Board. Thank you. So I've lived in Reading since 1988 after moving all the way from Danbury uh, to Reading. <laughs> and uh, it was largely because of the schools. I had my, uh, uh, my first child at that point, and uh, I was pleased to see all my three kids go through uh, the schools, as I said, K through 12. And uh, now, except for our dogs and cat, uh, Tammy and I are empty nesters here. Um, and uh, I've 
seen Reading from a variety of uh, perspectives, social, civic, political, et cetera. And uh, I think I have a sense of, of the community and I'm very pleased to be part of the Board of Finance. I'm proud of what the board has accomplished over the last 12 years. And I would very much like to uh, uh, secure your uh, vote uh, on November 2nd. Um, one of the things that I try to do is be conscientious about my job. I take it seriously. Uh, in the 12 years I've been on, there's probably been upwards of 200 meetings. And uh, anyway, let me just You've conclude by <laughs> let me just conclude by saying that, uh, as Chris pointed out, th this is a quirky race, but this the importance of your vote is for open-minded individuals who don't bring an axe to grind to the board of the board of finance there's a place for the people interested in education on the board of education but the board of finance has a broad portfolio where we consider the needs of the entire community and karen would be a very fine choice to join me thank you on the board thank you karen um I think Chris has been a terrific chair of the Board of Ed. And I think his skills in dealing with the budget are very useful when he brings them to the Board of Finance to be transparent and explanatory about what the Board of Education needs and why. Um, I have the skill set and the experience for the Board of Finance. The two things that really helped me when I was uh, a professional were collaboration and, uh, and transparency. And those are the two things that I will stress if I am fortunate enough to gain your vote, for which I would be grateful on November 2nd. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're going to welcome our Region 9 Board of Education candidates. And I will introduce you in the order in which they're seated. Cheryl Graziano is the Democratic candidate. Next is Gwen Denny, who is also a Democratic candidate. And Sean Alexander, who is a Republican candidate. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I will start the questions with Cheryl. Well, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, um, for, for coming out and for those of watching online. I will start by saying... Um, and Cheryl, for let me just say, I'm just going to ask you the question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's fine. We don't have an opening That's fine. statement. Okay. What community and public service experience do you have that qualifies you for service on the Region 9 board? What is the most important issue you feel needs to be addressed? Well, thank you again um, for, for having the debate tonight. Um, I will start by saying again, thanks for everybody joining. I think really to answer that question briefly, my qualifications over the last four years. Um, you know, we have been fortunate on many of us on Region 9, which is a bipartisan board, and we don't have quirky rules this year in front of elections, but my qualifications really, I think, speak for themselves. Many of you who actually spoke with me over the last four years, you know I'm accessible, regardless of party affiliation, where you're coming from, what type of citizen you are, and my accomplishments, along with my colleague Gwen Denny, as well as our colleagues on the Region 9 board, we demonstrated agility during, co during education during COVID pandemic and provided the necessary funding. We safely returned students to the classroom and were able to bring back in-person events, including graduation, continued specialized offering by finding creative ways to fund those programs without getting them cut, enhanced programs to support the social emotional needs of our students, not just, there's more than just excellence, there's more of feeling comfortable and, and being in an environment to learn. We, Barlow has ranked 16 as number of all high schools in Connecticut and the top 4% high schools in the U.S. We returned funds to the taxpayers of 2020. You can balance education and budget at the same time. It can be done. Participated in the negotiating committee that secured a three-year contract that manages taxpayer resources and retains our teaching talent and collaborated with all of you and communities, our family, central office, Barlow staff to appoint new superintendent and head of school. And I look forward, if I have the privilege again, to serve all of you for the next four years. Thank you. Thank you. Gwen? 
Uh, thank you, Colleen. Uh, thank you to the League for hosting this event and for everyone who's helped make it happen. Um, a lot, I know a lot of the folks in this room, I've known a lot of you for, there seem to be a lot of us who moved here in the very early 2000s, um, and I've enjoyed working with many people on both sides of the aisle over those years. Uh, my involvement with the school began um, 15 plus years ago when I was a member of the RESPTA Executive Board. Um, through that involvement, um, I started to attend board meetings and I started to dig in a lot more to the serious issues that impact our schools. One of my uh, first projects was a um, being heavily involved as a community member in a major renovation project at Reading Elementary School, which in, uh, tackled air, major air quality and uh, health and safety issues, and very proud of that. Uh, from there, I moved on to the Reading Board of Education, uh, and I, now I've been on the Region 9 board uh, for four years, and I'm asking for your vote uh, for re-election. Um, as Cheryl mentioned, we have had, a, as, as everyone else, a challenging time the last year and a half or so. Um, our board is bipartisan. We work together, um, and we have uh, done a good job, I think, keeping our kids in school, keeping our schools open. Right now, I see our biggest priority um, as, as getting our kids back on track, not just academically, but socially, emotionally, providing them the support that they need um, in, all of those, in all of those ways. Thank you. Thank you. Sean? Thanks, Colleen. Uh, as far as relevant experience goes, uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, the industry that I was in basically closed up. And so over the last year and a half to two years, um, taken a uh, startup and built it into what is now a, a contract with a large multinational organization. So I have some relevant experience in uh, guiding a, an organization. As far as relevant public service experience goes, not much to speak of. This is the, uh, the first time I'm, I'm trying for anything like this. And so Although I don't have anything to speak on in that regard, I promise I will try really hard and do the best I can for our school kids. So that's it for that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Gwen, you'll answer the, be the first one to speak to this question. Over the past 18 months, the Region 9 Board of Ed has seen the departure of two superintendents and a number of staff what are your thoughts on this unfortunate event, these events, and what will you do to fix this? I, yes, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been rough, not just for Region 9, but also for the Reading and Easton boards. As um, many of you are aware, we share a central office and a superintendent. Um, so this is not something that our board will have to tackle alone. This is something that we will have to tackle uh, in collaboration with both the Reading and the Easton boards. Um, I think that there is a perception that our working in our central office is an impossible job. I think there's a lot more that we as a board can do and we as a community um, to both educate folks on how things work. Um, and, and there's also things that frankly, uh, operationally, we could do a little bit differently that would make potentially make things um, move a little more quickly um, and, and be a little bit more time efficient as we move into more further into the 21st century. Um, I have a lot of ideas about meeting mechanics, which would probably be pretty boring for most of you, but once you're in this, you realize that the meetings stack up tremendously. Uh, anything we can do to improve the efficiency with which we get things done, um, and this is, uh, something that has happened through the pandemic is, is having more of our things happen online. That frees up a lot of uh, our administrators' time. Um, and frankly, we had a lot of community hostility uh, launched at um, one of our administrators who unfortunately left. Thank you. Sean. Thanks. Um, I believe the question said unfortunate events. Um, from the perspective that, that I've gotten, I'm not sure that they were all unfortunate. Um, I think that uh, when we have people leave and new people come in, it's an opportunity to uh, change up some things that the community was unhappy with. And so, although I'm not intimately familiar with all of, uh, all of the um, uh, staff changes, 
uh, from what I've been told, I think this is a good opportunity for us to move forward and uh, so create a, a new environment that uh, I think more people can agree on. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, you'll, the, first, the next question will first be answered by Sean. Chair. Oh. Oh, Cheryl didn't answer. I'm sorry. It's okay. I apologize. Well, can you repeat the question? Yes. Okay. Let's see where my question is now. It had to do with... So it has to do with the fact in the last 18 months, there has been uh, superintendents who have left and staff turnover. What would you do to change this? I think just so for purposes of the public's awareness, I think the three boards of education, Region 9, Easton, and Reading, have already addressed this by really filling all the open positions that we were unfortunate to have all at the same time based on events that Gwen mentioned as well as other things and COVID and, and you know, people make career choices all the time. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do, people have commented on, just the, the sheer administration across you know, what's required all five of our schools, not just in Reading, but also those in Easton. And I think within the constructs, the legal constructs of that, these are three legal separate districts. We have had tried to make inroads across all three boards, across all parties, to be able to do things like have coherent policies, have single policies across all of the all three districts, across all five schools, collaborate with central office, with our new leadership and central, uh, central office administration. We have a new superintendent being able to establish governance and rules of the road and operating rules so that we can better manage the meetings, to Gwen's point, reduce the number of meetings, reduce the administration, and then just really spend more, so, more of our time on effective delivery and efficient delivery of education in our schools. So the things we're trying to do, and you know, if you can, you know, if you elect the, the, the current sitting members in the Board of Ed, we can continue to do that in, in partnership with our other boards. Thank you. Next question, Sean. How would you communicate a clear COVID protocol in the schools? Currently, apparently parents do not know. Well, how would I communicate a clear COVID protocol? I'm not sure the communication of it is the issue. Um, as far as a COVID protocol goes, I think at this point, almost two years in, we should have a pretty good understanding of the impact that COVID actually has on our students, which at this point with all the data has, with all the data we have is almost none. Uh, it's been shown time and time again that young people, specifically under the age of 18, which is uh, how the data is recorded, they're not affected by this. They're not spreading it. And I believe that it is, it's wrong to keep them wearing masks and it's wrong to continue to have them live in fear and confusion over something that's not really impacting our community much anymore at all. Thank you. Can everyone just... Thank, thank you. Okay, thank you. We'd like to listen to all the candidates' views. Thank you. Cheryl? My, my oh, one-year-old got COVID. I, I just want to say, I, I, I do understand. My, my one-year-old got it. Mm -hmm. And um, he's okay. All right, so, thank you, Sean. I do have some we're not, experience. We're not gonna have a discussion now on this. I understand everyone has different views. We'd like to listen to the candidates. Cheryl? I think there's, there's a, probably be the, the there's not enough community there's you can always communicate you can never communicate enough with respect to COVID and providing parents that safe environment or, or having giving the kids a safe environment so the clear COVID protocol is just repetition of communication and providing that getting on the phone email emailing folks which is what people do we have zoom calls we have board of ed calls you know the people call the schools if they have questions to any of the elected officials the volunteer officials we direct them to the school so i think it's really just providing continue to provide that information and education so that our parents and students can feel safe and and you know and we are we are governed by the the state, the, the, the laws in terms of what's required by the state, which we do follow and we're very careful to follow and make sure that 
our local application of those rules are relevant for our schools and are appropriate. So really, I think it's really, and you know, some people just express some concerns about, about the safety of their children. It's really having, having that empathetic ear to those parents and kids and families that want to make sure that their kids are safe, and that's what we're trying to do. So I think really just repeating that, providing a safe environment for the, for the, for the children and our teachers and our staff, and making them all feel safe by following the appropriate COVID safety protocol. Thank you. Gwen? Um, I agree with everything that Cheryl just said. Um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, our administrators are, have been adapting our protocols um, as we have gone through the pandemic. Um, and as in, at the high school, some of our children, um, I believe we're over 50%, but not too much, um, have been vaccinated. Um, and it's, we have in the state of Connecticut um, a mandate where you need to wear a mask inside a school building. That's a rule. Uh, in the town of Reading, we have an indoor mask mandate for a gathering like this. Um, and what I think it's especially important is that our educators um, sort of check their politics and not communicate to our children that it's okay to not follow a rule because we disagree with it. Um, so if we have a rule in our school that says you need to wear a mask in an indoor setting, um, I happen to agree with that rule. I, I believe in the, in the science and the health and safety um, advantages to not spreading um, an airborne disease. Um, but I also believe that it's important to, um, to follow rules and to teach our children by example um, that they, they need to follow the rules of their, of their school and of their state and of their town. Um, and obviously we all have um, elected officials we can address and lobby if we would like to change those rules. Um, but I think it's very important that, our, that we communicate to our children that we do need to follow the rules. Thank you. Cheryl, next question. What work in diversity, equality, and inclusion needs to move forward at Barlow? And would you please include LGBTQ? So before the Region 9 Eastern Reading Boards of Education form its diversity, equity, and inclusion task force last summer in response to 500 students and faculty and staff and um, residents of both towns. We had across our schools three enduring goals and aspirations which still exist today. Academic excellence, cultivating future ready learners, and building a caring community. Our DEI statement, which addresses, addresses all those, as well as the required laws and regulations in the state of Connecticut with respect to education. And we are really, those, those objectives exist so that we can create a safe, inclusive, welcoming environment for all our students to learn. And many of us have spoken about the, how we measure the effectiveness of education. It was in an early, the earlier debate through school scores and test scores. But what we're hearing from our students and our families, it's more than just that. It's more of creating a safe and welcoming climate Making, making somebody feel okay so they can ask their, uh, raise their hand and ask a question and say, I want to learn this, and being not being afraid to say that. So I think a lot of our work is really just providing that safe environment for our students. And I don't think that any parent or adult or child would really object to that because we're just creating that, that welcoming, caring community for our students. So really that's you know, what, what I think the three boards have agreed and asked me to do through its efforts through DEI, as well as our ongoing efforts in education. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, again, uh, Cheryl has, I, I need to take the, just this opportunity to thank Cheryl for the work that she has done um, in this department because she's really been stepped up and been a leader um, and taken on um, a, a really difficult topic. Um, absolutely, our highest priority needs to be to uh, maintain a safe space for all students where everybody can feel comfortable in their own skin, can feel comfortable asking questions. Uh, we need to keep up our outstanding um, uh, teaching that we have at Barlow, which includes teaching the truth. Um, my uh, son had American history last year, junior year. Um, I don't know the exact course title, although Cheryl probably does. Um, but 
I just, the, the information that he received about um, Columbus coming to the West Indies, let's say, was considerably different from what I was taught in the 70s and 80s. Um, there was not a whole lot of happy, fuzzy stuff about pilgrims and Indians and turkeys getting cooked with corn. It, it talked about genocide, because that's something that really happened. And that doesn't mean that people of Italian descent should feel bad for being Italian because that happened, or people of European descent should feel guilty about that. But we also, we need to teach the history that really happened, and I think that we're doing an excellent job at Barlow in doing that. And I, I find, I, I like the truth. Thank you. Sean? Thanks. So, um, as the question was posed, I would actually support diversity, equality, and inclusion. Um, that's not what DEI, DEI is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's important to know that DEI, CRT, and anti-racism are all the same thing. Um, I particularly like the DEI acronym because it's a classic sales tactic of sandwiching the difficult sell between the good stuff. Because diversity and inclusion, well, those are good things. But what about equity? Equity means equality of outcome. Uh, sometimes it's called disparate impact. To get equality of outcome, you have to advantage some and disadvantage others. These days, that divide is along racial lines. And so basically what you have is teaching a system of racism. And I won't support that. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, the next will be Gwen to answer the next question. How important are social and emotional issues in academic content goals at Barlow? Extremely important, I, I would say critical. Um, and I think that this has been highlighted throughout this pandemic, um, sadly. Um, this is, an incredibly, has been an incredibly difficult time for many, many students. Um, and there's a wide range of students. Some, some kids got, got through virtual learning just fine, um, but we know uh, that many didn't, that many had a really difficult time. One of the ways that we responded as a board um, was by um, hiring an additional uh, school psychologist to, um, to help ease uh, this, the strain on that department for general ed students, especially knowing that we would have many kids coming back to school having not been in the building for over a year. We had some sophomores coming back this fall who had never been to Barlow, who had learned remotely their entire freshman year and had never, had never been in their school until they were sophomores. Um, supporting these kids is imperative. You cannot possibly thrive academically if you are struggling socially, emotionally. You cannot, and this ties right back in uh, to the important work that Cheryl has been doing, because you cannot thrive academically if you don't feel safe in your classroom, if you don't feel that you as a person are accepted for who you are. You can't possibly learn effectively. Uh, and those, so, uh, incredibly important would be the short answer. Thank you. Sean? Uh, could you repeat the question, please? How important are social and emotional issues in academic, academic content goals at Barlow? I think over the last couple of years, we've, we've seen that uh, social and emotional issues are very important. I think we saw a massive drop in test scores, and I think that was mostly due to uh, kids not being in school. I think there's been a hyper focus on uh, danger and safety. And I think that the solution to that is to devote as much effort um, that we put into an online remote learning environment now into getting things back to the way that they were. I think kids need to return to normal. We're seeing we're seeing the effects of it now, and uh, it's not good. And we don't know if these, uh, these effects are permanent. Uh, it's, it's reflecting poorly in the test scores, and I don't want our kids to fall behind. They deserve better than that. So uh, what I propose to uh, you know, fix social and emotional learning is to get back to the old normal, not the new normal. Thanks. 
Thank you. Okay, last question. Wait, Ask, Cheryl. I'm sorry. Cheryl. I just I keep, Cheryl. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no worries. So, so, so the social emotional learning is very important, and Gwen really highlighted, did a great job of highlighting what we've already been doing on the Region 9 Board of Education um, with our colleagues and, and those, uh, those that are educators in our building. And, you know, we've actually been able to invest more, as we said, you know, still being fiscally responsible, invest more in providing what our students, our teachers are saying, the necessary support from in our counseling office. Um, in our psychologist office because of the, not just the educational toll, but the emotional toll that during that, that, that pandemic has placed on our children, even prior to before that. So we're, we're providing the necessary resources we can. We've been able to also take advantage of some of the ESSER money um, with respect to uh, education, which provides some educational funding because of COVID um, for our schools across the U.S. And so we've been able to take advantage of that bringing bringing in um, folks like you know in student interns that we haven't been able to fund in the past so we find, found creative ways that would you know to be able to fund some of this additional education that's needed to be able to bring our students back to to where they were pre-pandemic and so i think there is a way to move forward and it's a, a new way to move forward and i think we we have had the online education we've learned a lot from that that i think we can hope to apply and improve the collaboration and, and across all of our students and different disciplines and and really just having more engagement. So we've already started to do that, and I hope to, um, to do more of that. Thank you. Okay, our last question, we're gonna start with you, Sean. Uh, our students don't score as well on the national comparative tests as students in comparable districts, and we spend more money by comparison. Why is that? It's a tough one to start with because I am not as familiar with the board as the other two. Um, I actually couldn't tell you why that is. I don't know. Um, but I do know that we should be getting a good deal for our tax dollars. We should be spending our money effectively. And like I said before, I'm not intimately familiar and I'm not intimately familiar with the budget, but I would like to be. And I think that this community, and I've seen so far, this community um, is, is capable of, of achieving. I know there's a ton of smart people around here, and um, there shouldn't be any reason why our kids aren't scoring as good as comparable districts. I think the numbers, I don't know when those numbers are from, but uh, I think that all of the numbers are out of whack recently. But um, the first step into uh, getting the test scores up and getting our kids where they need to be is getting them back to normal. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks. I, th I think there's a, just a reminder to Region 9 is one of the, the few regional school districts in Connecticut where we, you know, we, we are our own Board of Finance as well as our Board of Education, which is different from the K through 8. So, so we do service or you know, we do have that, that burden baked into the cost of the per pupil. So that's just something you know, just to keep in mind. Um, with respect to comparison with other Derg, Derg A, now certainly, I mean, we're, we're a regional school district, as, our, as I said, and with other Derg A schools, certainly they, those districts have more of a tax base to be able to have that revenue to be invested in their schools. But I think with respect to where we are in the Derg, it's an appropriate level of, of, of performance based on the level of investment we're able to provide from both Reading and Easton. And I think, as I said, we are, we're still, we are, we are top 16 in the state. We are top 4% in the country, and I think we do a very creative job between Reading and Easton to be able to fund education without cutting our programs. So, so I think you know, we, we do the best we can with the resources, and if our taxpayers say that we'd like to invest more to be able to, to provide excellence in terms of measurement of test scores, then that would certainly be a priority, but would want to balance that with the social emotional needs and be able to create an environment where the kids aren't stressed. Because one thing that we have heard over the last four years, and I think certainly before that, is the level of stress that the academics create on, on um, or the academic bars, if you will, create on the, the everyday learning of the students. So we want to be able to balance that and create that supportive climate for our students to learn. Thank you. Gwen? Yeah, um, and to, to follow up on, on Cheryl's point um, regarding the fact that Region 9 is a regional board of education, um, a regional school district that has one school, Joel Barlow High School. 
Um, it's generally more expensive to educate a high school student than it is to educate a kindergartner. Uh, however, if you have, if you are Wilton, you are averaging your per pupil cost over uh, all K-12. Uh, at Barlow, we are averaging grades 9 through 12. That's one factor. And there are also, as Cheryl said, debt service, physical plant, um, and very a, a lot of sort of complex things that add into. Um, that being said, per pupil cost is a um, one of a, not an accurate it is a very not a very accurate way to to judge uh, what uh, we're actually getting from our school. Um, I also think that we have had a philosophy at Barlow for a long time that and in Reading in general that prizes the whole child. Um, there are surrounding districts where students are often pressured to start taking APs, multiple APs, every year. Uh, that has never been the um, atmosphere at Barlow, not as long as I've lived in Reading, and in Reading in general. Um, this has been a town that has maintained gifted and talented programs in our lower schools, has maintained Project Adventure. We have always had a more holistic outlook um, than some of our more high-driving neighbors, and that's why many of us chose to live here and not in New Canaan. Thank you. We've now come to the closing statements that you can make, and we're going to start with Cheryl. <clears throat> so th thank you everyone for joining in the league for hosting this debate and for the opportunity to, to, to speak to everyone. So if I'm reelected, these are the goals that I would like to be able to achieve in working with all of you together. I will support Joel Barlow High School offering academic and non-academic programs that will develop well-rounded, well-educated well young adults who are empathetic to the world around them. I will ensure Barlow continues to be one of the, high, the high, top high schools in the state and keep it competitive with other schools in our DERG, but maintaining that, again, supportive climate where kids are less stressed. I will support a community that welcomes diversity, values, inclusion, and embraces dialogue and collaboration with, among people with different points of view, or the same. That's okay, too. I will work along town leaders to develop reasonable education budgets while maintaining transparency and constructive dialogue. And I will explore how we can influence state level policies. I think one of the one of the, the learning things or one of the things I'd like to be able to capitalize on is the importance of communication. So want to be able to communicate accurate information about our, edu our public education and what the great programs that Barlow provides for students. And so hope to work with all of you to be able to to spread that good news around the town. Thank you. Gwen. Thanks, Colleen. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I am incredibly proud to have been a member of the Region 9 Board for the past four years. I'm incredibly proud of Joel Barlow uh, and the education that we provide to our students. Um, while I truly value social-emotional learning, I, I do value academic rigor, and I think that we do provide that. Um, and I'll just share with you that I have a son who is a junior in college majoring in economics. And last week I went to have lunch with him in the city. And I received a phone call where he needed me to dig out some of his calculus notes from Barlow to bring down to support his work studying economics at NYU. Um, so I think we're doing a good job. Um, that said, we, we, we always need to strive to improve. We need to be constantly looking at what we're doing and asking how we can do it better. That's part of our job as an oversight board. Um, and it's our job to, to make sure that we're pushing our administrators and our staff and everyone to, to keep moving us forward in the right direction for all of our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Sean? Thanks. And thanks for everyone uh, coming out tonight. Um, I think it's very important that uh, when we send our kids to school for six hours a day for 12 years, uh, what's being uploaded into their brains is in alignment uh, with our choices as parents. And if I'm elected to the board, my number one goal is to bring choice to the parents. If there's an option between mandate and choice, I'll always side with choice. I'll also be a bulwark against radical policies. Um, thank you. I think we can all agree on the fundamentals and we should agree to disagree on the social stuff and leave it out. I want to move forward with strength and with, uh, well, 
not, uh, not move forward with um, fear and confusion. And I think our kids deserve that, and I think that's what we can do. Thanks. Thank you, all of you, for your willingness to come forward and serve on the board and do all the hard work that you, you are doing. So I want to also say thank you to all of the candidates, to our screeners, to those who came tonight, to our viewers, and Cole Tucker Walton, who's over here, without whom we wouldn't have this set up. He's our 5G on the League of Women Voters board. And Bob Moran and Chris, who, without whom we could not share this. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you.